I'm El Kamihira and welcome to Subject to Power. Is it realistic to think that we can achieve equality, not just between men and women, but between people, while at the same time putting women's reproductive capacities up for sale? To hear Jennifer Lal, who's a filmmaker and world-leading expert in bioethics, in particular assisted reproduction, as it's so nicely named, talk about all of what's going on in the fertility industry, it becomes very hard to overlook the dehumanization involved. Behind the terms that are now part of our everyday vocabulary, egg donation, freezing our eggs, surrogacy, sperm bank, in vitro fertilization, lies a much more complicated reality of economic interests. Jennifer peels back the layers to show the real impacts on the women whose reproductive parts and pieces are being used and asks some big moral questions in the process. Hope you enjoy our conversation. Not everyone will know who you are and your work and the institute that you founded. And I'm just interested to know how you began, what drove you to found the Center for Bioethics and Culture. So I would love the story behind the story. Well, I like to tell people I'm kind of a science tech medicine geek. I worked in clinical nursing for many, many years, predominantly in pediatric critical care. And I always worked in big university hospitals. I worked at Children's Hospital in Oakland, big inner city children's hospital. So we saw the sickest of the sick. And we also worked with the, you know, the leading cutting edge physicians, which I absolutely loved. I mean, I fell in love with that kind of environment. And I like to tell people I worked at University of California, San Francisco with the doctor who did the first surgery where he took the baby out of the mother's womb and then did the repair of the defect and then put the baby back in the womb because it was a defect that if it could be fixed before the baby was born, the baby would be born absolutely fine without any problems. So I just love that kind of stuff. But on the other side, you know, you just see kind of this brave new world coming. Where are we headed? And so I was always interested in not can we do things, but should we do things, especially in the context of pediatrics, you know, parents are making decisions that they have to live with for the rest of their life. Whereas, you know, as doctors and nurses, they make a decision, we never see them again. I'm a big believer in informed consent and having as much information as possible so people can make good decisions. So I went back to graduate school and studied bioethics because in the olden days, we had medical ethics. But what was happening in the hospitals is that ethics was done by committee. You know, the lawyers would weigh in, the hospital administrators, because of how much is this going to cost us? You know, the lawyers, are we going to get in trouble legally? The social workers, the doctors, the nurses, we were deciding by committee. So I studied bioethics, which is, I mean, we all have a stake in these new emerging technologies, especially in assisted reproduction. We all have a stake in how children come to be made and how they come to live on this planet with us. So I founded the organization I now run, the Center for Bioethics and Culture, when I was in graduate school as my thesis project because most nurses are doers. And I just thought, wow, how do I encourage a robust societal conversation and not just Silicon Valley, which is in my backyard, just saying, here's the new gadget we're all going to buy. And everybody rushes off to the Apple store to get it because, you know, Silicon Valley has spoke. And so now here I am all these years later, you know, making movies and traveling the world and speaking on podcasts with you. When I look at all your communication and your presence in the world, the topic of human dignity comes up a lot. And I think human dignities can be very hard to grasp as a concept. And so I wanted to just kind of ask you, what, what does it mean to like protect human dignity? Well, for one, it is a difficult word in depending on the context, and that can be geographic. So like when I was in France, doing one of my documentaries on surrogacy, I remember somebody in the audience just got up and they're like, we are French. We do not do this with the human body. They had a sort of a, an almost identity as French people that they're just, you would never exploit a woman for her womb. It's undignified. New York State legalized commercial surrogacy. The task force under Mario Cuomo to look at surrogacy, which made New York State not a commercial surrogacy state, 
taught that this was an undignified use of the body. So when I think of human dignity, it's back to there are things we can do, but there are things that we should never do because it's undignified. It's treating somebody as an object, as a commodity, as a product. And that's not, in my mind, the way that we are to treat one another. I think it's almost easier for people to understand that when they think of like humane treatment of animals. And it's cruel to leave your dog in a hot car while you go shopping. Intuitively, they just know that's inhumane. Looking at your films, and I have to admit, I had to walk away sometimes because I just, it just put me in a rage spiral. (laughs) Some... I think when you kind of like take it in all together, it forms a certain picture of exploitation. So it's just, it's hard to stomach parts of it. I know that you've made kind of major documentaries about egg donation, surrogacy, and now transgenderism. And so I wanted to kind of hear from you, like what that kind of evolution is from your point of view. I remember one of my earlier first films, I made this film in a weekend. It's called Egg Exploitation. We won Best Documentary in the California Independent Film Festival, which is a real film festival out here in California. But one of the women in the film was a PhD student at the University of Kansas when she saw an ad to sell her eggs. And she was all but dissertation in her studies you know, grinding out work, jobs, trying to make ends meet, trying to finish her schooling so she could get her degree. And she saw this ad and went, wow, I could sell my eggs. I could quit my job and spend all of my energy on finishing my dissertation. And she was seriously harmed from that decision. And I was asked to testify at a hearing in the state of Kansas. And I went to Alexandra, that's her name. She was the University of Kansas student. And I said, would you come with me? Because I'm a carpetbagger. I don't live in Kansas. You know, oh, here comes this person from California. I think Kansas people are probably very suspicious of Californians anyway. And I said, would you come with me? Because if they won't listen to me, maybe they'll listen to you because you were in their state at one of their universities. So she she came and she testified beside me. She was treated horribly. You know, we're really sorry that happened to you and how unfortunate for you. But, you know, too bad. You know. And I remember we got on the plane to fly back to California. And I was so disappointed because I thought, well, if they won't listen to a woman who almost died while attending a major university in your own state, what's going to happen? I said, you know, why don't we make a movie? I said, if I made a movie, would you be willing to be in it? And she said, sure. And I already knew Kala Papademus, who was a student at Stanford, who suffered a massive stroke trying to sell her eggs. I knew Cindy, who also was a medical student in California. I I had the people I wanted to interview. And we made that film. And in four weeks, we had DVDs. That was back when you made DVDs and people bought them. <laughs> and it was at that point, I just said, you know, film is a way to communicate through the power of stories. Because if they won't listen to me saying, this is risky, this is dangerous, this is exploitative, you know, maybe they'll listen to these women. And that, that film, Exploitation, has been translated in, I think, five different languages. And so we just continued to make movies. And I can't tell you how many times I'm out there speaking and I'll have young girls that will come up to me and say, I I saw your movie and I'm so glad because I was thinking about selling my eggs. And I'm so glad I was warned. That's amazing. And were you simultaneously interested in surrogacy or did one thing lead to another? What happened as soon as exploitation came out, I was inundated with emails from what we call the donor conceived. So young people that are here because of anonymous, mostly sperm donation. And they were asking me, please make a movie and tell our story because we want to know where we came from and what's our medical history. So that's when we made Anonymous Father's Day. And after we made Anonymous Father's Day, it's called third party reproduction. We've got to make a film to finish out the third party conception story. And that's when we made Breeders a subclass of women. We made breeders in a way that was helpful legislatively because we are also very active in the legislative battle, either testifying in hearings, trying to encourage good laws or stop bad laws. So we interviewed women that were in all categories. You know, they did it for free just to help. They did it for money because they needed money. They did it for a family member. They did it for strangers. We even interviewed an altruistic surrogate who it was her genetic child that she gave away to say that no matter how you try to dress this up, 
these problems don't go away. It doesn't make it okay if you do it one particular way. So we wanted to push back on that. Then when we followed it up, we weren't planning to make another surrogacy film, but we did. It's called Big Fertility. We did Big Fertility because it's the U.S. surrogate doing it internationally. And we'd already been testifying in Spain. We'd already been testifying in the U.K. We'd already been testifying in France. And we'd been in Italy because the debate where most of European countries don't allow surrogacy, the debate is they need to come into the 21st century, be like America, be like California. Kelly is featured in that film, and she did two international surrogacies and one U.S. surrogacy, just to sort of let the audience see the complexity of this whole reproductive tourism and how one state has open borders and one country has closed borders, that it just encourages more of that kind of international buying and selling of babies, if you will. Yeah, which is some people object to phrasing it that way, but what else can you phrase it as? Yeah. And then we moved into the trans issue. We weren't planning to, but when we made the film Transmission, What's the Rush to Reassign Gender? I was a pediatric critical care nurse. And when I found out that young minor children, before they're given puberty blockers or put on cross-sex hormone drugs and put on that path to medical surgical transitioning, they're offered fertility preservation. So they're offering, you know, 12-year-olds, do you want to bank your sperm or bank your eggs so that once you damage your sperm and egg through these wrong sex hormones and you grow up one day and you want to have your own genetic children, you can go back to the, the egg bank or sperm bank and get your gametes and have your baby through assisted reproductive technology, which is our, that's our, that's our sweet spot. <laughs> oh, the money. All the money. <laughs> and we're just creating lifelong patients that will forever have to come back for something to help them do what their body was supposed to do in the beginning anyway. And so once you made transmission, did you get sort of get deeper into the whole issue? Yeah. And so we're working on a film now called The Transition Diaries, Saving Our Sisters. And we follow three young women in America who thought they were born in the wrong body, who had gender dysphoria, who said, if I just get on testosterone and do the surgeries, all my problems will go away, only to find out it didn't solve anything. And one of the women had a double mastectomy. You know, the women are worried about being on testosterone. How's that negatively impacted their ability to have children if they one day decide they want to have children because they took wrong sex hormones for a long period of time? So because we're into the, that technology space, which is also a transhumanist issue, <laughs> I'm not very yeah. fun at cocktail parties. <laughs> <laughs> no, I bet you are. <laughs> my, my kind of cocktail party for sure. <laughs> so I did want to drill down into these concepts a little bit more, the ones you've made films about. So starting with exploitation, you know, I have a daughter. She spoke to me about wanting to freeze her eggs just the other month. And it is sold in many ways as just another thing that's accessible to you now that you can just kind of take your eggs out and place them in a bank for safekeeping. And that frees you up from like the biological clock. But it's actually much more complicated than that. So I wanted to just, the processes by which you harvest the eggs is a complicated, lengthy, I would say very risky process. Yeah. So I, let me just have a, a, a preface. When you think of the different women who decide to do this, there's infertile women who for some reason have to try to get their eggs out of their body to do IVF. There's the egg donor who's just doing this to sell her eggs, make money, or maybe she's giving them away. Or there's people like your daughter who are just trying to beat the odds of the biological clocks. And all three of those women are going to be treated a bit differently. The infertile woman is definitely going to be treated like a patient. She's got the respect of her doctor who's really trying to help her. The egg donor is going to be treated like a vendor. You know, we just want to get as many eggs from her as we possibly can, because the more eggs we get, the more money we make, especially if she's from Stanford or some Ivy League school. The woman like your daughter who just is trying to beat the clock, you know, she's going to be sort of a hybrid of those two. All three of these women are going to take fertility drugs in order to super ovulate their ovaries to produce lots of eggs. Right. So they're all taking fertility drugs. Now, the patient model, a lot of times she's put on lower doses. You're not trying to get 60 eggs from her. You know, maybe you want to get 
five or eight. So, so they're going to, you know, titrate the amount of fertility drugs she takes down to a, a lower rate, a real lower dosage. Same with the woman who's trying to just bank her eggs for her own use later on down the road. She's probably not going to want to bank 60 eggs. So she might be put on lower doses. And so the egg donor is the one that's probably the most at risk because she's going to be put on just the big guns. And if she gets into trouble when she's taking the drugs, she's going to be told, stay the course, stay the course. We don't want a failed cycle versus your daughter or the infertile woman. If she starts having like really bad ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, you know, they'll dial back the drugs and they'll actually manage them more like a patient versus like a vendor. But anyway, whether you're taking the lower doses or you're taking the higher doses, they're not without risk. The procedure, like you say, is risky because you are stimulating the ovaries to produce lots and lots of eggs. Then there's the surgical procedure with anesthesia. We already know surgeries and anesthesia have risks. And then we, we know that there's a longer term risk of the fertility drugs. So like in exploitation, Alexander went on and had breast cancer and egg donors are screened out. They don't have any history of breast cancer or they're, all, they're not selected. Two of my colleagues have published in the medical literature case report of five otherwise healthy young women who are egg donors who went on as young women who got breast cancer. These women were all screened out, no medical history, no BRCA gene, you know, none of that. Isn't it? Interesting that otherwise healthy women, the only thing they had in common was that they were egg donors. A woman who's banking her eggs to use them down the road, you maybe beat the biological clock in that you have your eggs versus you're not in menopause now, which means you don't have any eggs, but your uterus is still old. And if you just Google maternal age and pregnancy risks, the older we get, we have more risk and complications. In exploitation, you talk about that there is no long-term research into what happens after the egg donations. So the long-term effects, there's just no data from what I understand. Is that? Yeah. I like to say, I didn't coin this term, but what doesn't get counted doesn't count. And we don't count these women. We don't track them. They're not like an organ donor. If you're an organ donor, you forever live in a database that says you gave a kidney. And the person who got the kidney is forever in a database that says they got a kidney and they got it from you. The egg donor, one of the women experts in the film says once they're done with her, she's gone. There's no regulation. There's no follow-up. There's no database. We don't know if a baby is born in the U.S. through egg donation and that baby's born with some rare genetic disease. We can't go back to the egg donor and say, you should have this genetic test because this baby was born with your eggs. I mean, there's just this gaping hole of data. So when the egg donor is told part of her informed consent, there's no risk. She needs to be told there's no known risk because we've never studied this. Do you really want to be a guinea pig? Questions that I have, because I know egg donors who go on and have trouble conceiving and getting pregnant on their own. We're taking her eggs, harming her own fertility. So then she becomes an, a patient in the IVF clinic when she wants to have her children. We don't know how much of breast cancer we're seeing in women. How many of these women took high dose fertility drugs, either for their own IVF or they were egg donors or they banked their eggs. You know, that's data that we could go back and gather because we've been doing this for long enough periods of time that we could have good sample size and just do like a massive call of breast cancer data and find out in these women's histories, did you ever take fertility drugs? And how, how often, how long, how many times? Julia Derrick, who wrote the book, Confessions of the Serial Egg Donor, I think she did it 12 or 13 times because she would just need more money and go back and she would hop around to different clinics because they don't track you. But at the end of the day, I don't think we should be doing this anyway. It gets back to, do we really want to risk a young woman's life especially if, if there's money on the table and especially if we know she needs money, why can't we as a society find ways for women to make money that they need to make without selling their bodies or harming their health? Yeah. In addition to which, if I understand it correctly, we were born with a finite amount of eggs. We're not like men who just produce and produce and produce indefinitely. We are born with a finite amount and we run out eventually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and we know that as women, the, the range of menopause is really wide. So some women go through early menopause, like there's women in their early thirties. There's some women that don't go into menopause until their fifties or sixties. And a lot of times we don't know that about ourselves. We might think, oh, I'm you know 25. I got plenty of time. And this woman might not know that she's going to start going into menopause in two years. 
And it's not like men, like you say, that, you know, make new sperm at the minute they ejaculate, they're just making, they're making more. Exactly. So the last point about exploitation is since we don't track anything, we don't know what they're being used for either. And so the simplest assumption is that they go to make a baby for someone, but there are other things, aren't there? Yeah, they go to scientific research. And in California, if you're an egg donor, you can be paid to sell your eggs for research. Like if you're the woman who says, I don't want 50 kids out there running around, you can designate your eggs to go to research. And I think that's obviously problematic too, because then it gets to back to we're using people to another end that's perhaps very harmful to them, but very lucrative to big pharma, big medicine, big technology. I mean, many of the researchers in California, they own patents. So if they develop some new novel drug or treatment based on embryo cloning research, then anybody who's developing something off of their their findings, those researchers are making money. So there's this profit motive that isn't looking at the health and well-being. And people aren't willing to do the research. They're not willing. They're just they just want to say it's not risky. Yeah. And at a time where women are being more valued for their parts and pieces and functions and services, who's looking out for that woman who's selling her eggs? I'm always telling women, don't risk another woman's life because you want to have a baby. You know, stop it. The, The biggest feminist organizations in the United States are very supportive of women doing this. And I I don't understand that. If you're going to be the National Organization for Women or some big, because they love babies and they love women helping women have babies. Oh, but she'd be a wonderful mother. And I I have three daughters. They're they're grown and married now, but they have heard me speaking for years so that I know that they would never, if they had trouble conceiving, go and buy eggs from an egg donor, ask a woman to carry their baby or anything like that. That's great. They're lucky to have you as a mom, I think. (laughs) (laughs) So moving on to surrogacy, one of the things that struck me about both of your films about that is the conditioning and seduction of the surrogate. And not just the surrogate, but her partner and family and sometimes even wider web of relations that has to sort of buy into. And I think when we're talking about making women into a product, we are not looking at the fact that this woman is benefiting and living in a web of relations and life and family. And that all of those things go into her. And I just kind of wanted to put that out there to talk about the kind of preconditioning of her state of mind to get her, what are the things that seduces a woman into wanting to do surrogacy? What are the things? Well, a lot of it's just a slick marketing. The advertisement is always, you're an angel, you're helping, and you can make a lot of money. You know, we're looking for you. It's win-win. You know, you get some much needed money. This couple, this person gets a baby that they've always wanted. And so the marketing, unlike The egg donors are heavily marketed and the ads are in their campus newspapers and their Facebook feeds. Young girls at university don't want to be pregnant for nine months. They want two weeks, maybe four weeks of fertility drugs, a surgical procedure, and then here's your big fat check. So they're targeting women who are young, stay-at-home moms. In the U.S., surrogates, overwhelmingly, they won't pick you unless you've already had a baby of your own or a couple because one, they want to know that you can do the job You've had successful, uncomplicated pregnancies. Two, these are typically low-income women, not impoverished like they are in India or third world countries, but they're women in the lower income tax brackets here in the U.S. You're not going to want to keep the baby. You're not going to change your mind because you were doing this for the money, not to have more babies. And so we heavily target that sort of profile. Military wives are heavily targeted. Military wives tend to be underemployable or underemployed because they know that their spouse is going to be moving. And so why would a company want to hire somebody and invest in training somebody if in six months you're going to be moving? So they tend to have trouble finding better paying jobs. And they like the fact that they can stay at home. One of the women in the Breeders film I made, she liked the fact that she could stay at home and raise her children versus having to go to work and then everything she made would have to pay for daycare. 
so that the money afforded to her allowed her to be a stay-at-home mom. And she liked that, which I, I get. I think those are societal things we need to change so that if a mother wants to stay at home with her children, she shouldn't have to live on the street <laughs> to do that. And so that, that's the marketing. And they aren't told of the risk. They're not imagining that this doctor or nurse would be asking them to do anything that might be harmful to them. You know, they're just groomed. They're never told to call it a pregnancy. They're always told you're on a journey because they immediately try to get this woman to disassociate, sort of like the prostitute who disassociate from their body in order to do this horrible thing that they don't want to do. So they're told, you know, they're just groomed all along that you'll hear that it's their bun, but my oven, those kind of phrases, they all have their shirts on their little t-shirts. I see these pictures that just make me sick. Like this, they call them intended parents. I call them the baby buyers and and the surrogates, big pregnant belly. And they've got their hands all over her belly in this big smiley photo op. And it just makes me cringe because I just think it's so exploitative what they're doing. And when I look at the years I worked in pediatric nursing, We move mountains to get mothers to be able to stay with their sick babies when they're born. We we understand that that maternal child bonding begins well before the birth of the child. We've never ignored that that was present. We've never ignored that that was a good and important thing. The whole breastfeeding after the baby is born is so good for mother and child. It's so good for attachment. It's so good for physical healing of the body and nutrition of the baby. And all of that is just shredded to bits. When you take these babies, they say wet from the womb and just plop it into stranger's arms and think that nobody's going to be traumatized by that. It's mind boggling. And what does that do to little children in the home? One of the women in one of the films, her children were just so programmed that when money got tight, they would just say, well, mommy, go have another baby for somebody. And do we want our children, do we want them to think that that's what women do? And and then little kids are so concrete in their thinking. You can just see a little three-year-old thinking, well, what if mommy gives me away from money someday because money gets tight? One of the women talked about how they were in the grocery store and they saw the visibly pregnant mother. And the woman looked at the little child and said, oh, are you hoping for a little boy or girl? You're going to have a brother or sister. And the little child just chimed up and said, I don't know. We're not keeping the baby. (laughs) And you have to think, you were talking earlier about like the whole family. I know several surrogates that their marriages broke up because it's it's hard enough being pregnant in a marriage. Right. And you wonder, you wonder what it does to the relationship. These guys met in high school or college, got married, had a family, and you wonder what it does to like just their intimacy, their sex life, their ability to connect. Like you're selling something that's so central to their existence. Yeah. And for especially more traditional men, I've seen you know, men that feel less than because they their wife had to do this because of money. And a lot of surrogates tend to be from more traditional kind of families so that men want to feel like their wife shouldn't have to do this in order to put food on the table. But there's just all, all of the risks that we're just finding. My colleagues and I just last week had our research published on the risk to the surrogate mother's health. And we're seeing now, because we've been doing more and more surrogacy, that these pregnancies are in a whole separate category of risk from natural, spontaneous conceptions. What our study did, which was has never been done before, I think I can say that, we took 97 American surrogates through an exhaustive survey that compared their own pregnancies with their surrogate pregnancies. High rates of C-section delivery compared to their own children, high rates of chronic illnesses. There was a lot of preeclampsia, a lot of hypertension, high rates of high-risk pregnancies where women didn't have postpartum depression with their own babies. They had it with their surrogate pregnancies, which makes sense. They go home with no baby and they're sad. And we found that these are the lower tax tier women. They're not poor, but they're in the lower, lower tax brackets. They're not the rich women that are doing this. So it's similar to organ donation. You needed a kidney and say, yeah, here, take my kidney. It doesn't work that way because you might reject it. When a woman has a foreign embryo in her body, her body immediately goes, this isn't me. This isn't, you know, we, we see that with women who get pregnant with egg donors. 
We see that with women who get pregnant with sperm donor. When we're in in a relationship with a partner, we get used to their semen in our vagina. And so we build up a tolerance so we don't have these kind of inflammatory reactions. Google away, audience listeners, because this is all out there to be readily found. I'm not just some crazy lady making stuff up. But yeah, our our bodies don't like foreign objects in them. And so even if we develop a relationship with a male partner, immediately when his semen is in our vagina, our body goes, what is this? This isn't part of me. But we build up a tolerance to it. Also, it's well, well documented in the literature for women who use an egg donor that she will have this inflammatory reaction because it's not her egg. The same goes for the surrogate. You know, when you're using an egg and a sperm, creating an embryo that's not related to that woman or her partner, and you put it in her uterus, her body develops this immune response. The medical literature is there that shows even if she's pregnant with one baby, that 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 problem is going to happen. But if she is carrying twins or triplets, of course, that does compound just the complications. As we know, anybody who's in a high order birth pregnancy is going to have more complications. Surrogates overwhelmingly deliver by C-section. C-sections are not without risk. That's why we try not to use them. And we still have way too many C-section rates in countries like the United States. We in the U.S. have horrible maternal morbidity and mortality rates. I mean, you look at California and New York, very, very wealthy, wealthy states. We have horrible. And so we're compounding what we already know as far as pregnant women's health by adding on this extra risk of asking them to be surrogates. And then we really pile on when we wave a big, big fat check in front of women who need money. I just think that's morally reprehensible to be doing that. Completely agree, which brings me to advertising and grooming may be very slick and getting them in the right frame of mind to do this, but the contract is not so friendly. The contract is very, very, very strict and detailed. I was shocked at how detailed and all the things that is controlled by the contract. Can you talk a little bit about that? Again, I'm just a geek because the first thing I do when a surrogate reaches out to me because she's in a pickle is I say, send me your contract because I want to read what she signed and what she agreed to. And the language is always tilted toward the moneyed stakeholders. The language is always punitive. If you don't comply, if you don't obey, if you do this, then you will be in breach of contract. If you're in breach of contract, you'll have to pay back all the money. I love the French because they actually have documents that liken surrogacy to slavery. And I go, yeah, read a U.S. contract. Read one that's been drafted and executed in the state of California. And you tell me that this woman isn't enslaved. There's no standard contract. It's sort of the whims of whoever the purchasing people are. So I've seen contracts where the purchasing couple says, we want you to eat a vegan diet because we want a vegan diet body for our baby. You know, you can't color your hair. You can't travel a certain way. You can't have intercourse with your partner and all the way to even more reprehensible things. One woman in California, she was a surrogate for, which is often the case, people she never met. I mean, she probably had some kind of phone conversation, but she didn't know them. And they had a clause in her contract that said, if she required during her pregnancy to be on life support, the intended parents had the authority to decide if and when life support was removed based on how far along she was in the pregnancy. And she signed that. She was a young mom. They were very poor. Who thinks as a young mom, they're ever going to end up on life support? Oh yeah, that'll probably never happen. I need the money. Sure, I'll agree to, in her case, she didn't end up on life support. What she ended up was that she ended up in a triplet pregnancy. She had agreed in the contract, she had agreed to the language that they call it either termination or a selective reduction. So either you are agreeing to terminate the whole pregnancy or you're agreeing to reduce down the pregnancy from one, two to one or three to two, whatever. And so she'd agree to all that. And she ended up getting pregnant with triplets. And so they actually wanted her to reduce the pregnancy down to two. And she wouldn't. And the reason she wouldn't, what happened was she was implanted with two embryos and one of the embryos naturally twinned, which happens. So she had two twins and a singleton. And the singleton was a girl 
and the twins were boys. And they wanted her to reduce down one of the boys because they wanted the girl and a boy. And she just felt like, I can't do that. In her mind, even though she signed the contract saying she would, she would do all that, when it came to the reasons why they wanted her to do that, well, we just, well, we got two boys and a girl, let's have one of each and get rid of one. And, you know, it was kind of like that Sophie's choice moment. Of course, these women don't, they don't understand because they're not told that when the lawyer has you sign the contract, that lawyer is representing the money interest. He's not your lawyer. So they think they have a lawyer. And then they call their lawyer who drafted and executed the contract. And the lawyer goes, oh, no, no, no. I was just making sure you understood the contract before you signed it. I represent them. I don't represent you. And she has no money. She can't go out and hire a lawyer. This is how I get a phone call. (laughs) She ended up not reducing down the pregnancy. She gave birth to triplets. She has no way of knowing if they kept those babies or not because she has no right to know. So did they go home and just keep a boy and a girl and give one boy up for adoption? She doesn't know because they just don't know. (sighs) I know. So I feel like I need a cocktail and it's only 11 in the morning. (laughs) I know. I know. So there's lots to discuss about the economy, obviously, of surrogacy. But one thing, looking at the pie chart, if you're looking to buy babies through surrogacy, hire a surrogate, you are getting ready to pay a lot of money. And only people who have that kind of money can afford to do it. And so the pie chart of where the money goes. Can you explain that a little bit and how the lion's share of that pie does not go to the woman who's carrying a baby for nine months? Exactly. I mean, she's, if you want to put it in the context of work, and I don't agree that pregnancy is work like a job, but she's doing the lion's share of the work 24 hours a day, seven days a week for at least nine months. And there's always several weeks in advance of taking all the drugs, getting ready to have the embryo transfer. So for basically 10 months, she's enslaved by this contract. The California surrogates make way more than say perhaps a surrogate in Kansas, you know, because we have, you know, just the economics of the different state. But a surrogate pregnancy is easily a six-figure pregnancy. When you get a take-home baby as the couple who's hiring the surrogate and hiring the contract, the lawyer and all that, you're easily spending, I would say, $150,000, of which part of it goes to the lawyer who's taking care of the contracts. Part of it goes to the fertility agency. They're the ones that are out there pimping and finding women that they can put them in their catalogs, pick her eggs. She's gorgeous. Pick her womb. She's done three surrogates. She's very compliant and obedient. The, the, the shopping catalogs are being run by the agency. Then you've got obviously all the drugs that the women have to take, all the doctor's appointments. So the physicians are making money. The labs are making money. There's all these people that are making money. And then a, a little sliver of it will go to the, the surrogate mother. But again, the sliver, especially in states like California, if you're a proven surrogate, you've done this before. If you're willing to carry twins or triplets, you get more money. So there's a sort of an inducement to do it again and do it again and to be willing to take more on. In California, a surrogate can make $35,000, $40,000. But still, when you think of the fact that it's easily costing $150,000, she's getting a fraction of that. I watched an interview you did with Trey Cox, who is a man whose wife died as a result of complications with her surrogate pregnancy. Can you talk a little bit about, and I have some questions about their story. It was this a really difficult interview to do because it was it was just gut wrenching. The way I usually find out about these surrogate deaths, and I'm sure that's how I found out about his wife Lydia's death, is through GoFundMe accounts being set up because the news isn't reporting this. A friend of the surrogate who's died, or you know, family members will set up a GoFundMe to help Trey and their children survive. So I reached out to him and I asked him if he'd be willing to speak with me. I, I told him who I was. I said, I'm very much against surrogacy. I want to be very forthright because of the work I do. I think it's important for people to hear that surrogacy is risky. We'd already had one woman in California who died, Michelle Reeves, during her surrogate pregnancy of amniotic fluid embolism, which is what his wife died of. So another thing is like, is our amniotic fluid embolism more common in women who are carrying surrogate pregnancies? don't know, but some something we should be looking into. So I sat down with him. It was her bucket list. She was just sort of the classic. I love having babies. I love being pregnant. I'm done with my family. 
but I would love to help some other family. They actually know their surrogate family. They got to know them. They didn't know them. They became very close. It was a real tragedy for them. Can you imagine every day you look at your baby and you know that you have this baby because this woman lost her life. And this child is going to have to be told this story one day that the woman who gave birth to him basically died. And all these other children that Lydia had lost their mother, which is very common. We have so many surrogates in the U.S. that have died and their husbands have lost their wives and the children have lost their mother. And he didn't want to tell her not to do it because it was her bucket list. And so he wanted to be very supportive. But he does agree that people need information. And then the best way to have information is for people to hear him speak and tell his story of when she woke up and she was immediately in distress and he didn't know what to do. And he called 911 and she was full term ready to, you know, full term pregnancy at nine months in a pregnancy, you're just humming along waiting for labor to kick in. And he was just devastated, devastated. Basically, she died in his arms. A horrendous, horrendous story. My follow-up question to that, though, and I, and I felt for him a great deal, but I also, I guess at some point, felt that he too had been seduced. He too had been groomed. He too had been kind of not been told everything and continued to sort of have a great deal of faith in a process through which he had lost his wife. So it was a little bit heartbreaking on that score as well. And one of the questions you asked him was if there was a life insurance policy on in the contract. And there was. Mm -hmm. And so he then was paid the life insurance through the surrogacy contract. Mm -hmm. And is that common? Again, it's because the contracts are not standardized. It's at the whims of the intended parents. So sometimes they'll write into the contract that the intended parents will cover the health insurance during the pregnancy. Sometimes if the surrogate already has health insurance with her job, this contract will say that the surrogate's employer will cover the health insurance. If there's a life insurance policy that can just be at the whims, it's not required that that's written in. It's not required that it has to be a certain amount, a fifty thousand dollar, a hundred, a million dollar. You know, there's. It's just really, I think, because in this particular case, because it had such a good relationship with this couple, they got to know their family, they got to know the other family, they just really liked them. I mean, the intended parents are seduced at one level too. I want to heap some of the blame on them, but they're also seduced because they're also told. Yes. This woman wants to do this. It's her choice. She wants to help you. This is a good thing. This will help you. It will help her. Everybody wins. When I was speaking with him, it was very clear that he didn't want to say anything that would disparage his wife's character or yeah. her dream. He was trying to be incredibly careful. I want to say that my sense was that he was more outraged and angered by what happened but in, in deference to her wish to do this, I don't really know that he was like keen for this to happen, but he knew it was so important to her and he, he agreed. And I'm sure yeah. there's so many days that he wishes maybe he had said, no, we're not going to do this. It's too risky. Yeah. Yeah. I got that sense as well. Yeah. Which, so I do want to talk about the economy. Like you mentioned earlier, you don't see rich women offering to carry poor women's babies. So this is very, very, very driven by economics. And so what, what's your read on all of that? Yeah, I like to use the state of New York as a case study because up until a year ago, commercial surrogacy was illegal in New York State. And one of the champions of the bill to legalize commercial surrogacy in New York was a state senator by the name of Brad Hoyleman. Brad Hoyleman is married to a man and Brad Hoyleman and his husband have come to California twice to buy eggs and rent wombs. His whole argument was we need to legalize commercial surrogacy in, in New York where altruistic surrogacy was allowed. The law allowed women to have babies for strangers, for friends, whatever, but they just couldn't be paid. And his argument was we have a supply and demand problem. And until we can pay women, why do we have to go to California? where it's legal to pay women. So, but the argument was women aren't gonna, I mean, what woman is gonna be pregnant for nine months and just give away a baby for nothing? I mean, it's clear with egg donors, overwhelmingly women aren't donating their eggs. They're doing it because the money, 
And if you take the money out of it, it really dries up the supply and demand equation. You can get all kinds of people to do something for money and you can really get them to do things when they think and are told that what they're doing is good and wonderful and not risky and not harmful. Right. And also thinking back to Trey and Lydia Cox, or even any of your surrogate mothers that you've portrayed in your films, the idea of being an earner in your family, the idea of also bringing home the bacon, the idea of contributing is hugely appealing. And especially if it's done in the traditional realm of like appealing to what women do anyway, caring providing for their families, caring for their families. And I think that's why it makes military wives even more vulnerable because they're even more conditioned to service, you know, because their their spouse is serving in the military, serving the country. It's, it's a wonderful thing to be helping, sort of adding layers to that, that, that women are more nurturing, more wanting to help. Yeah. But I'm also thinking about the driver of that kind of like why everyone is so willing to get behind the forming of the family, that that's such a powerful driver and people so get behind that, whether it's gay couples who want to form a traditional nuclear family or whether it's a childless couple, the sympathy is so great for that. Part of me says two things. And we have to take the gay same-sex couples out of the equation because there's no fertility problem. They just don't have all the parts needed. (laughs) But when you look at women and men, you know, infertility affects almost equally men and women. We've stopped looking at infertility as a medical problem. We stopped finding how how to treat, how to cure, because we found a workaround. We'll just go right to the fertility doctor. We don't have to understand why this couple can't conceive. We don't don't have to waste any time there. You want a baby, we'll get your baby in nine months. Just go over here and you'll get your baby. So we're impatient. We're very impatient. And that's different from the same sex couple where there's just nothing wrong. People, they're selfish. We're selfish. We, we, I'll put myself in that. We're selfish. They want a baby that has some kind of a biological connection to them, right? So even if the surrogate's going to carry the pregnancy, at least it's going to be in the sense of a gay couple, well, one of our, our sperm and the infertile couple, well, maybe we'll use an egg donor, but I'm still carrying the baby. But there's this sort of in our mind, we still have a genetic connection to the child. And I do see the new trend with the, the same-sex gay couples and the single dad, the single man, whether he be gay or not gay. I don't know. There's a lot of just single unpartnered men that want to become fathers by buying eggs and, and renting wombs. And part of that's because we've just normalized it. There's a lot of single women who have become mothers through sperm donation They either don't have a partner, don't want a partner. So everybody wants what they want. And we have technology. And if you have money, you can get whatever you want. And it's hard to push back on that. It's hard to fight against that. When I think about all the different legislative hearings that I've testified in for and against pieces of legislation, everybody knows somebody that struggles to have children. Everybody knows somebody who would make a wonderful mother or father or parents. Isn't it a shame that they, you know, everybody's been touched by that. And so it's hard to say, we're not going to do that anymore. And all those people that got their babies that way, well, that's great, but we're not going to do that anymore. And we need to close those loopholes. I mean, that's why we always say surrogacy is a global problem that needs global solution. When I was in Madrid speaking to the members of the European Parliament, I said, your law is wonderful. Your law is beautiful with one exception. You need to not let the Spaniards come to the United States to damage and harm and exploit our women. It's great what you're doing here for Spanish women, but knock it off. Australia overwhelmingly don't allow for much of this. There's one territory that does, and there's people that just thumb their nose and go abroad and get their babies and then come back. And nobody's enforcing the law. You have to close loopholes in laws. And then once you have the laws, you have to enforce them. Kelly Martinez got into a pickle with her intended parents that were from France because she, again, did not understand international surrogacy laws. And it was at the last minute that these gentlemen told her that she was going to have to lie to the French consulate and she was going to have to say that she had an affair with one of the men and that these were her babies that she was giving to them in order to try to save her marriage. But that was because they wanted those children to go back to France with French passports. And here was poor Kelly, who just had a high-risk C-section delivering twins, having to drive hours 
to get down to the French consulate in a state that she didn't even live in because these demanding men were saying, you have to do that or you're going to be stuck with these babies. And she was poor and already had two little children of her own. (laughs) I mean, when you hear stories like that, that is the logical conclusion to treating human beings as products. She signed these papers in the consulate that were all in French. They weren't, nobody interpreted, nobody translated. She had no idea what she signed, but it's just the fear that these women, you know, live with when they're in these pickles, in these contracts. And this again, the power, the power imbalance. It makes me wonder, how can these people even be good parents if they're willing to treat a woman this way? If that's their character or their sense of entitlement, I think, oh my gosh. That brings to mind something Kaisa Ekman said that what they're paying for is not just the baby, but a motherless baby. They're paying for the mother to be out of the picture. Somebody sent me a TikTok video the other day. I'm not, I'm not plugging TikTok. I hate TikTok. Um, but <laughs> it, was TikTok. A, it was a surrogate and she had just given birth to twins and she had been promised that she could see the babies. And of course, as soon as the babies came, that was, nope, no, nope, we don't, we want you to go away. So she was describing the postpartum depression, again, back to our research. And the comments were horrible. You were hired to do a job. You were paid to do your job. You were not supposed to be the mother. One woman even said, this is the number one thing that worries me about, I'm thinking about using a surrogate, is because I want them to disappear and I don't ever want to hear from them again. And I just thought, who are these people? They have no business being parents. (laughs) It was the heaping on of these insults to her. Like you were just hired to do your job. Go away. Like, oh, it's horrible. The devaluation is just stunning to me. Yeah. So I I wanted to talk about your work that you're doing, shedding light on the issues that come with transgenderism. I kind of want to just ask a general question. I think The conversation is evolving every day about what it is and isn't, and more people are, I think, coming into it and so forth. But what are your main concerns with this incredible rise in transgenderism? As far as the transgender debate, to me, it's sort of like two different categories, two different conversations. One is children. And in, in my mind, it's a bright line. I don't think we have any business blocking puberty. I don't think we have any business medicalizing these children. We have certainly no business doing any kind of surgeries on children to castrate little boys. As you say, it's sort of, it's evolving. But what we're learning is a lot of this is social contagion. These are children that have other issues. Maybe there's some autism. Maybe they're same-sex attracted little children. Maybe there's some kind of trauma or something going on in the family dynamics. There's all kinds of other things that we can acknowledge that this child has some kind of dysphoria or discomfort, but we don't need to address this through medical or surgical intervention. To me, that's just clear. And people that argue that children should have their puberty blocked, I go, okay, you know what? One of the biggest, most prominent trans women gender assignment surgeons in my backyard in the San Francisco Bay Area has already said that children who have their puberty blocked at Tanner stage two will never have orgasm. You know, you are forever assigning your young child to never have sexual pleasure as an adult. I think if people just heard that, they would immediately go, oh, no, no, we're not going to do that. Let little boys play with dolls. Let little girls do whatever. Let them wear whatever kind of clothes they wear. You know, those are not issues. One of the women in the the new film I'm working on, The Detransition Diaries, she thought she had all these problems. And she realized she was just a young girl that was just sort of figuring out life. And she hadn't figured it out yet. You know, leave these kids alone. Isn't that a song? Leave these kids alone. (laughs) (laughs) Now, when we get into adults, I think a lot of this is just, I don't want men in women's prisons. I don't want men in shelters for women who've been victims of domestic violence. I don't want men pretending and masquerading to be women competing in sports. And I don't think this is controversial. But, you know, you say that kind of stuff and people go, you're a hater, you're a transphobe, you're a bigot. I don't want people who have these fetishes or these notions in their head to be thrown in jail. I don't wish them harm. I want them to live the fullest life they can possibly live. 
but we need to acknowledge their biology. Back to my background in clinical nursing, if we're going to do a new drug study on a prostate cancer drug, we're not going to recruit women to be in that study, even if they're women who say they're men, you know, because the study, the evidence, the findings would be meaningless and vice versa. We don't want to find a new treatment for endometriosis and recruit men to be in a study to look, that looks at endometriosis. They don't have endometrium. It's, just, it's absurd. And we're always looking at new drugs and new treatments for sex-specific illnesses that only women get or only men get. And so you have to be able to say there are things like men and women, and that's science. That's not hate. <laughs> One of the things that scares me the most is the shutdown of debate. The fact that you can't have an opinion for fear of being ostracized or really heavily punished Mm -hmm. for a wrong thing. And it's real. People are are losing jobs. I shouldn't say people because it's mostly women. Women, (laughs) uh, Women lose jobs, lose their living, lose status, are made into pariahs and so on. And I think that there's something underneath this that we're not talking about. I hate seeing language being held hostage and we can't speak out. And like you say, it's mostly women who are the ones that are losing their jobs. I mean, we've seen what's happened to J.K. Rowling for speaking out. People want to burn her books and even people who starred in her Harry Potter movies who made a fortune off of her just feel like they can throw her under the bus. I think we all lose. We all lose. We have to have a really wide berth on free speech even though we, that means we have to listen to people say things that we think are crazy or vehemently disagree with. I think the worst thing is that we have this totalitarian like policing of what we can say and what we can't say. I guess I was born with a big mouth. <laughs> I think, you know, courage is contagious. And I think the more people that do speak out and say, no, I'm sorry, the emperor is naked. And then other people will go, yeah, I agree with her. The emperor is butt naked. We all lose when the thought police come in and say, you have to do this and you have to say this and you have to call somebody a man or a woman that is clearly is not. And you have to let them come into your safe spaces. I mean, I love Kaisa. I love Kelly J. Keene in, in the UK. I mean, the women in Europe, they're like rock stars. And I'm, I'm just hoping that it catches on like wildfire over here in the United States. It feels like the biggest gaslighting possible to have to look at a man who's masquerading, like you said, as a woman and having to say, no, that's a real woman. When we just know that in our bones that he isn't. My heart really goes out to like in California, incarcerated women here. We've got over 200 men who have now identified as women. And these are not men that ever medically or surgically transition. They just all of a sudden wake up one day and say, I'm a woman. You have to imagine the fear and terror. You're already incarcerated. Many incarcerated women are in prison because they've they've had a horrible life already for all kinds of reasons, ended up them being incarcerated. And now they have men in their prisons. And there's been stories of women who have gotten pregnant now by these men. And you don't see women identifying as men saying, put me in the man's prison. You kind of kind of go, hmm, what's going on here? Very asymmetrical fight going on. So you mentioned your new film. Detransition Diaries. Detransition Diaries. So what are you finding out? We're finding out, even if we just only interviewed these three women and their stories, their stories are very similar to many, many detransitioners in that they were offered the wrong kind of help. There were all kinds of red flags. When you've got you know girls that are already self-harming, that are depressed, that have eating disorders, those things should have been dealt with and addressed versus putting them on a fast track. You see this overwhelmingly only to affirm, not to really dig around and saying, what's going on with you, young woman? Why are you having these feelings? What's going on at home? What's going on at school? And dealing with the patient holistically. So all these women and men do transitioners too, say that they were not offered what they really needed, which was good therapy and counseling. They're finding out that all these things that they did to their body did not fix anything because those underlying problems weren't addressed or dealt with. They're finding out that these things that they did to their body that they were told were going to be good and helpful have caused them to have lifelong 
chronic health problems because of taking wrong sex hormones and because of doing surgeries, you can't create a phalloplasty without harming things or a neo-vagina. I mean, these are really, really rough surgeries that have all kinds of layers of complications and never work like the real things do, you know? So, and that is, I think the tragedy. We wanted to focus just on women in our film because it is predominantly really taking off with young women whether it be they already have body image problems, whether it be like the social contagion, everybody's just saying, this is what you are. You should be trans. We wanted to just look at this through saving our sisters, which is the tagline of the film. I can't wait to see that. And I think just circling back to the puberty blockers, how it's sold as a pausing your puberty when there's really no such thing because, and I'm talking out of school here because I'm not a medical professional, but it's not like you can then stop the puberty blockers and it will all restart as per normal, correct? Yeah, I mean, when you just think of normal human development, human development is a constant continuum. It's not like this happens and then your body just stops doing anything. And then this happens. You move from embryo to a fetus, to a baby, to a toddler, to a preteen, to an adolescent, and it's constant. And all of that is happening. So even if you're blocking puberty, hair is still growing, bones are still growing, you're getting taller, things are still happening. But in your mind, you're creating this illusion that you can just stop this really critical part of human development. We're, we're just this amazing organism and everything's tied together. And you can't just shut something off and think it's not going to have any kind of harmful effect. And then you flip that light switch back on again or flip it off again. It doesn't work that way. And so there's this, this language out there all the time you'll hear, we're just, we're just pausing it. We're just pausing it. And in fact, if you look at most of the children that are put on puberty blockers, the next step is almost overwhelmingly to go on to the cross-sex hormones. It's not like we pause it and we wait a couple of years and we go, nah, let's turn the switch back on. And now you're going to be 16 and now you're going to get pubic hair and now your breasts are going to, and your voice is going to change. It doesn't work that way. We're not like building a house where you can just stop building it move the door and put it over there. And they go, no, I think we want the door over there. We're, we're a highly connected organism where everything is dependent on everything else. And it's timed. It's not for us to decide when you become a toddler. It's just, you just do it. You just... These things resolve all of the angst and things we went through as teens. They do resolve. I'm watching all these young girls being tormented and you just kind of want to scoop them up and say, you know, you're going to be grown someday and be able to deal with all of this. You're going to get through it. Yeah. And I think this is what makes me so outraged because of the years I worked in healthcare, that the medical community is doing this. They are endorsing it. They are celebrating it. And I think it's criminal. And we will unfortunately have many lawsuits like we're already seeing happening in the United Kingdom with the Kiara Bell case. There, there's going to be children that are going to be harmed and irreparably harmed, long-term harms. Grace in our, our Detransition Diaries film, she goes, I don't feel like a man. I just feel like a woman who's had her breast cut off. And I think what a tragedy. And she worries, like, will I be able to have children down the road because of the effects of testosterone? That's one of the unknowns. There's things that we know that are irreversible. There's things that we know that are irreversible, like women who take a lot of testosterone. Hair loss is irreversible. So these women are going to maybe one day be walking around as women, but bald. Two of the women in the film, and one, one of the women, Kat, she's actually an incredible, uh, talented songwriter. And she's written and produced a special song for the film. There's a clip up of, of her singing, but her voice is different. It's much deeper because of the effects of testosterone. And that was one of the wake up calls for her was her voice when she was taking testosterone. And if she was looking at having top surgery and thinking about maybe getting bottom surgery, I mean, if this is words is to say top and bottom surgery, it's like body mutilation surgery. And it was the fact that she is such a talented and gifted singer that her voice was changing and cracking that she kind of sort of woke up and went, oh, this is part of me that I really love that I, I have my voice. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that reminds me of, I forget who said this, but 
I think it was a politician in Washington state. It's a clip online where she was arguing, she was a proponent of transgenderism and just said, well, it's not like, you know, if they cut off their breasts and they want them someday, they can just go get some. I find that so inhumane and so cynical. I just can't believe we live in this world. It's inhumane and cynical. And we even say this in the film, Grace's insurance covered for her double mastectomy, but they will not cover reconstructive surgery. So insurance paid for her to have healthy breasts amputated, but her insurance will not cover for the reconstructive surgery. So, so yeah, you can just go get them, but it might cost you tens and thousands of dollars and they won't work. Like your healthy breasts that were cut off. Wow. Sinister. Sinister, sinister. Yeah. I, and I don't, I hate to end on such a down note, but let's not. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to win this one. We're going to win this one. We are going to say loud and proud. Yeah. Women are adult human females. Amen to yeah. that. And maybe having to show the absurdity of it is maybe the wake up call we all need. And that's why we make movies. Yeah. And they, they can't walk away and go, she's a liar. I don't believe her. They might not like what these women say. They may want to discount their stories. But a big seed has been planted that maybe what I thought was good and true isn't really good and true. Yes. Yes. Every bit of this is stuff that people really need to think about and hear. And I'm so glad we we got to talk. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Subject to Power. You can find the show online at subjecttopower.com or subscribe from wherever you get your podcasts. I would love to hear your thoughts and comments, so please drop a note on the website or even better, take a moment to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. Subject to Power is written, hosted, and produced by me, El Kamihira. Audio engineering by Jason Sheasley at Abridged Audio. Cover art by B. Johnson and the music is by Beware of Darkness.